Do you like the internet? Of course you do. You're using it right now. But how does one access the internet? Maybe by Wi-Fi? Your phone? No, think simpler. You got there by your keyboard. You use your keyboards daily, hourly even. But have you ever sat back and looked at one? If you're typing in English, why wouldn't it just be A through Z? I mean, it would make more sense if it was alphabetical, so why isn't it? I want you to meet Giga Chad, amateur politician and inventor, Christopher Latham Scholes of the 1800s. He made a nifty little gadget called the typewriter. You may have heard of it, quite literally. A lot of people before him made inventions like the typewriter. An Austrian guy made a few prototypes. A few guys made literary pianos, which is literally what it sounds like. A Danish dude made this fucking thing, but he thought he could do it better. Originally, it was actually designed to be a numbering machine that was automated that could number things like movie tickets or book pages or magazine pages. However, during the patenting process, he met with his lawyer, Carlos Glidden. Carlos looks at the thing, looks at Christopher and goes, why don't you just make this for letters? Christopher is like, Nah, fam, that's too much work. I already made this one, so just patent the damn thing. About that. That changed when the southerner named John Pratt made the OG typewriter called the Patera Type. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. About a year later, in 1867, it was featured in an article of a magazine called The Scientific American, and Carlos Glidden quite literally laughed, threw the paper to Christopher, and he was basically like, get a load of this guy. And he called the Patera Type, I quote, complicated and liable to get out of order. Basically saying, Oh brother, this guy stinks! Additionally, the Civil War was fresh in everyone's heads. They were Northerners and John Pratt was a Southerner. So they knew they could do better and they were going to do better because they couldn't stand to have a Southerner have this W. The war may have been over, but the hate for both sides was alive and thriving. So Christopher listened to Carlos Glidden and started to convert his invention to a full alphabet typing machine. There was one big problem though. Even after 30 different prototypes, the typewriter just kept jamming. Can you guess what he did to fix it, kids? Here's a hint, it's in the damn thumbnail. Pay attention. Christopher sorted the letters in a way that it was sorted by letter frequency and wasn't placed by the commonly used letter pairs, so they had more time to return. Now, if you're wondering why we were having to wait for it to return, unlike modern typewriters that instantly spring back into place, it's because that at that time, they used weights to bring the keys back to the resting spot. This fix wasn't permanent though. It was a band-aid until they could figure out what they could use instead of counterweights to make these keys pop up faster. Obviously, they settled on springs, but at the time they didn't know that, so they just shifted the keys in the meantime. What the shifting of these letters achieved was that there would be more time in between the keys that are commonly used to reset as people would reach across the keyboard and would cost a few milliseconds of time for the weights to reset. Because as I said before, if you try to press on a key that isn't fully reset yet, it'll actually jam and the key press will actually just be stuck and you'll have to fix it. In this kind of weird transitional period, a company wanting to expand from their previous Civil War manufacturing of firearms wanted to kind of branch out their catalog. Now this company was named E. Remington and Sons. Now that name might sound familiar, because if you own any firearms, uh, let me you prove it. probably are familiar with the Remington brand. Yes, it's the same one. The dates on the sources are kind of fuzzy, so Remington might have actually had the patent shortly before this keyboard change, but for the small amount of people that bought it, they loved this new keyboard. It had the signature QWERTY at the top, and though it was a little different than what we know today, it was pretty damn close. The only real differences was the M key was swapped and a few other minor differences, but it was overall successful. So Remington bit the bullet on these manufacturing changes, took some ornamental styles from their sewing machine department and took the QWERTY keyboard and included a full number row. It was a change, but a welcome one. People who bought the typewriter, including Mark Twain, loved it. Mark Twain is quoted as going as far to say is that it was a curiosity breeding little joker and the keyboard would remain virtually unchanged for over a century. More specifically around the 80s, the 1980s. Why the 80s? Well, there was this neat little thing coming out called computers that started to be used. Although they were popular, they were mainly used for word processing and number crunching, unlike now where it's gaming and Pornhub. The only real changes from the typewriter to this was that they introduced a numpad to the keyboard 
And towards the late 80s, when we started seeing the shift key, the escape key, and the function key, they were still pretty much the same. Now, if you want to get technical, there was the teletype, which was before the computers, and it was basically just an electronic typewriter, but those keyboards weren't really a substantial enough change to even document this. And speaking of keyboards, how about you use yours to leave a comment really quick while I give you a minute? I'll wait. Fast forwarding to the 90s and 2000s, keyboards were still pretty much the same on computers, but a new competitor rolled around on phones called the T9 keyboard. Come 1996, a very early smartphone rolled around called the Nokia Communicator 9000. It had a Sibian operating system and it was kind of like the precursor to Android, but it had telephone functionality, obviously, faxing, which was pretty sweet, SMS, which was very new, the internet, which was also very new, contact lists, notes, and even a freaking calendar, and some extra features to sprinkle it on top. At this point, you start to see full-size keyboards being implemented with the same key layout as earlier teletypes and typewriters. Although they kind of shifted throughout the models and brands, they overwhelmingly took the same shape and layout with a little bit of changes for the features on the specific phone or whatever the brand felt like doing to be wow. special. Come the late 2000s, people wanted more screen real estate for more multimedia features like emailing and camera and whatnot. So phone manufacturers started accommodating this with bigger screens and ditching the keyboards. And obviously something being digital and one screen versus a physical manufactured keyboard makes it a lot easier to make things uniform. A lot of people still preferred the physical keyboards, including myself because I'm an old fuck. Uh, it didn't really catch on until the iPhones rolled around with multi-touch displays, which would allow users to type with more than one finger. Other companies started to take notice and started to ditch the physical keyboards to make multi-touch screens with digital keyboards so that they could have more screen real estate to do fun stuff. But that brings us to where we are now. In fact, we're almost coming full circle with folding phones, but not having the physical keyboard. Most, if not all iPhones have the same keyboard with a little bit of buttons here and there, like for language changing and stickers. And Androids have the GIF buttons and theme change buttons, but they're all the same layout now. Now we can happily hunch over our phones like raccoons eating trash, holding hands in uniformity. And that is why our keyboards look like that. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and suck off the like button or whatever YouTube wants you to do. But most importantly, go outside, touch grass, and stay hungry.